agenda we have um, the, the main theme is is to have Jan take us through the rest of the uh, uh, code revisions uh, so that hopefully next meeting we'll have Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Roll call, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Bagnell. Here. Mr. Coronado. Here. Mr. Duzan. Here. Mr. Elrod. Here. Mr. Graham. Here. Mr. Metcalf. Here. Mr. Ranville. Here. Mr. Rudnicki. Mr. Samuelson. Here. Hey, you have a quorum. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. No problem. I appreciate that. Um, on the agenda tonight, we want to get through the rest of the zoning code revisions, um, and um, uh, we'll focus on that. And then I think hopefully, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, next at the next meeting we'll have a regular meeting where we'll be reviewing the ordinance uh, with it, making a recommendation. Hopefully, uh, one of the next couple meetings. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully. I, have to, I still need to put it in that form, and we do need to have that all reviewed by the city attorney's office, too, but before then. So I'll we'll have to okay. kind of see how her timing is with her schedule. But that's, okay. I'm going to get that to you guys in the formal ordinance form as shortly as we can. So. Okay. And we have, uh, we've recorded all the concerns we got out of the last meeting, and we'll address those when we bring forward the final draft. Um, so those are things we are working on. And I have four on my list. One was we want a more specific description of the sketch plan um, and when and when not you would have to submit certain things. And I, I just looked at a draft today. I think uh, Jan has reached kind of the embodiment of what we want there. Um, and we talked about the STP as possibly an allowed use in another district. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to address that this time around, but it's certainly on our to-do list. Uh, we talked about uh, the mobile homes. Should we leave it as is? And then finally, uh, we had discussion about language regarding requiring a registered landscape architect with landscape plans. And we'll address that as well in two weeks. All right. Do we need to revisit any of those now, or should we move into the next? Uh, I think we should just use a study session to move into okay. the current stuff. That would be my suggestion. Okay. Um, any comments from the commissioners? Anything we need to cover before Jan gets started? Okay. The floor is yours. Well, um, this, this half, I don't know if you've read through this or not, is a little simpler than the last study session we had. This was the easier half. <laughs> Um, I just to highlight some of, you know, most of this was some little housekeeping things. Most of these changes had to do with is removing the DRC. Um, just a brief overview. Some of the more significant changes I did make other than those things are um, in Chapter 8, which addresses conditional uses. Um, I did, um, since we were going with the, oh, we already went through amendments to the PD overlay process and um, Change that appeal process from the district court to a city council, you know, and so I followed the same uh, proposal with the conditional uses because the current code leaves a planning, an appeal to a planning commission decision to district court. So to make that consistent with how we've changed it for PDOs, um, I, mod I proposed a modification for the conditional use to be appealed to the council if, if the applicant um, decides they want to appeal. The other, um, the other change I proposed is um, came up by uh, um, one of the planning commissioners at the uh, at a more recent hearing where I had a um, time extension for this approval in front of the commission, and so um, I proposed some language in there to um, to have a provision allowing the director of community development to to administer, administratively grant a time extension. Certain circumstances, which were very much related to this, this one that was in front of you, you know, when actually the the applicant's proceeding ahead and he's in the building permit stage, and and it's not just a, a situation where the use is actually becoming abandoned. You know. So, I um, put a proposal in there for. Um, 
that's kind of the main stuff I had left in the sub or the zoning code and the subdivision regulations. Um, you might be a little bit confused about the first change I had proposed, which was in Chapter One. It looked like I deleted a whole bunch of stuff about when a plat's supposed to be recorded. And the reason why I did that was because several years ago, um, uh, council uh, approved another ordinance. Oh, I'm not loud enough. I'm not good at this microphone stuff. That's good. Okay. Okay. Um, several years ago. Uh, Council approved an ordinance that uh, actually approved another type of timeline for final plat recording and signing and all, and yet for some reason that ordinance didn't delete the section in Chapter 1 of the subdivision regulation like it should have because it was actually intended to replace that. So it's that was a definite housekeeping thing was to remove that um, obsolete provision. Um, let me open that up. That's... Jan, in particular, that was 11.16 and 11.17? Yeah, uh, yeah, let me get to that so I can... Yes, um, it was 11.16 and, yeah, 11.17. Um, actually, yeah, 11.17. Um, and, uh, and then... Oh, and then the other the other major change I made uh, with the platting applications is the or the application procedures in the subdivision regulations is that uh, I was a little, when I first started working here they were in here because this this code of course is like 40 years old and it actually allowed the um, applicant to do their own outside referral <laughs> which. I came to work here and I thought, wow, this is strange. I mean, we never did this where I used to work, you know. And, and, and then I did find out that, well, this doesn't really work because outside referral agencies won't look at an application unless it's being processed through a jurisdiction like the city or the county. So, so that, and that provision still was in this chapters. And so I decided to, well, let's take that out since that's not what we do. Um, another, we do typical, you know, where staff, city staff does the outside referral and gets the comments back just like you all have seen. Um, the other thing that was sort of different in the subdivision regulation was the minor subdivision plat. It actually, minor subdivision plat has a preliminary plat that's administratively reviewed and approved by staff, and then a final plat that goes to city council. And um, the way the code was written, it was intended for the minor plat to just be one document that came in, preliminary and final, all rolled into one. <laughs> and since I've been here, we've never processed it that way because surveyors don't want to record a lot of that information that they put on a preliminary plat, you know. So, so it actually ends up becoming two documents, and it's processed very similarly to the major plats that you guys get, except it doesn't go to the preliminary plat doesn't go to planning commission. So, since we don't, you know, since we don't process major, minor plats the way the code is written because of that technicality, I tried to change this so that it now reflects how staff does process platting applications. So that's, that's the major housekeeping I did in the subdivision code. And um, there's a lot of other things that need to be taken care of and straightened out and fixed and modified in the subdivision regulations. But those are, that's going to be another major project <laughs> that comes back to you all later down the road here. But the, this was, this is getting rid of the DRC and basically, um, you know, making, changing the code to be consistent with the practical way that the plats are processed and have been for the last, probably since this code was written and I found out this didn't work then, so. Um, and then the other thing is I did finish up uh, the draft, this first draft of the operating standards um, to include these other application processes that are the subdivision plats in the last few um, from the zoning code. Um, and I just want to preface that this is a, the purpose that this is in front of you guys is because I wanted to show you, because since we're taking things out of the code and putting it in the operating standards, I just wanted to show you that these things aren't being deleted or disappearing, that they are actually going somewhere else to be used in a practical manner for the applicants. And this document, the operating standards, is very 
draft. <laughs> it, uh, it's not final. It's definitely probably going to need some reformatting and some tweaking and all that kind of good stuff. I'm hoping to also uh, modify our application forms and kind of get them up to date and everything. So this is a little project in itself. But I just want you to have this, see this really rough draft so that you can see where things are getting moved to and stuff. So. And uh, there may actually be some, you know, more improvements in this as well. And I do, I do appreciate your suggestions on some of the things. Um, but that's, I just kind of wanted to explain that. So um, I guess at this point I'm open up for any questions you might have or, or any suggestions or. Yeah. Um, the operating standards um, remind us, will they be recommended for approval by us or they, will they go through a different? Approval process than the code revisions. Well, it's kind of. I think ultimately we see it as, you know, how community development operates um, in, in processing applications. They certainly relate to what you're doing here because now they're all codified. They're all part of the code. Which the reason we're taking them out is, as technologies change, we don't want to keep bringing forward um, new code amendments. So. We really see it as kind of our internal operating standards um, that we use and making sure we're consistent with applicants as we go through the process. So it'll be sort of a living document that doesn't necessarily need to go through any council approval or it's, it's going to be a guidebook for you all to use. I mean, that, and that's true. I mean, we have, um, like for instance, um, the engineering department, they have a they have the storm drainage criteria manual, which is a similar type of thing, although more highly technical. But that's the purpose for that, so that when regulations and different things have to change that are technical related for that, they don't have to keep taking this back to city council for another review. So it's, it's a similar item. And we have a landscape criteria manual, too, that was adopted years ago. And it's, it's the same. It's the same type of document. Will we still <coughs> provide it with whatever the final version of the sure. operating standards? Yes. Right. Yes, and, and also because um, some of uh, a couple of the uh, if your suggested changes last time are addressed in that book, and so that's and I need to explain that to you next time, so I, you'll have that too. I have a specific question about the Chapter 8 conditional uses where we, the time extension approval that is now administrative, uh, the one year, it just it seems kind of odd to me to have a planning commission request for a six-month extension and an administrative request for a 12-month ex extension. Shouldn't it be way around. the other way around <laughs> or somehow? Or the same. Or maybe I've, the same, or uh, um, I mean, why would somebody come to the planning commission for a six-month extension when they could get a twelve-month extension administratively? Well, the, well, that's a good point. I mean, the twelve-month extension is is you know in the in the situation like where I say where building permit issuance and construction delays occur. If somebody's asking for another an extension for another reason, then that would be something to go back. To the planning commission, but um, you know, you know, it's certainly if, if you recommend changing that to a twelve-month extension rather than them being able to get two six-month extensions and coming back and forth twice or something like that. I mean, it's we certainly do that. I mean, I, or, or maybe differentiate why one kind of request would come to the planning commission and another kind of request could be handled administratively. Yeah, it wasn't wise, clear uh, to me. Yeah, right. I think it might not be clear to an applicant. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if it's a case of, like, let's say an economic issue where they just didn't get the use off the ground, that's something that would have to go to planning commission. Yeah. yeah. But if they're in the process and there's some kind of construction glitch, that means they can't open within that period of time. That's my little amount of window. Yeah, that's what you. I was proposing here. All right. But. The Planning Commission, though, can grant two extensions, which equal 12 months. If I'm right, not, right, right, but at separate times. And we already did that, so I, I know we have. Yeah, you that. did. You did for yeah, you did that exactly right. already mm -hmm. for that one. 
given, you know, I guess because of the slow timing of any kind of development now, six months seems pretty aggressive to, to require. Um, well, you know, to tell you the truth, um, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem. I don't know how Glenn feels, but I, I certainly don't have a problem with changing that six months to a longer period of time. I mean, you know, people right now, the way the code is written, site development plans get a year. Um, you get a year to record your PD overlay or your PD plan, you know. So, I mean, the, the 12 months would be in, consistent with that. And, I mean, this six months was, was, like I said, I don't know how old that provision is. It's older than me, but, you know, so. So, in total, it could be three years? Well, so one you, year you, can, you, can say you can do one year with maybe one year extension beyond that, or you can do two, or I wouldn't. So, so does this read that I mean, the other, 12 months, you get 12 months from the approval, and then you can get two more extensions of six months each, which takes you to year two. And then in addition to that, the director can extend it for another year. So does that, is that intended to be, could it be cumulative like that? So it could be three years before? Two years. Two six-month extensions from the planning. That's from planning commission, but then the director has well, another 12 months, so it's three, three years, years total. But she's yeah. suggesting that, that then it might administratively be extended after the two, two planning extensions. commission extensions, then it could be three years. Well, but it does in lieu of. All it says is an extension, <clears throat> an extension for of approval for no more than one year, may be granted by the director. I, I think this is all the more reason to try and differentiate why. Yeah. A request would go to the planning commission as opposed to the director. Yeah, because it's, it's well, if I were an applicant, I'd be, you know, what am I supposed to do? Who do I go to? You know, we have another, well, right now there's another threshold in conditional uses. For instance, um, if they're amending a conditional use, if the square, if they're proposing to expand their conditional use and the square footage is less than 25% increase, that can be administratively approved. If it's over 25%, then it has to go back to planning commission. So we have a threshold on that part of it. So, um, wondering. so that, that's I'm in here sure. somewhere, but it, yeah, you know, maybe it's, it's not, uh, I'm not proposing to change that. I'm just right. saying that there's as an example, that's another threshold between an administrative approval with the conditional use and a planning commission approval. So I don't. Somewhere in here, the applicant ought to be able to, to know under which conditions he goes to the planning yeah. commission, under which conditions he goes to the director. Yeah. And not only that, I think we need to clarify whether it's cumulative, you know, two six-month extensions plus a one-year or a one-year in lieu of one, one or two six-month Or not extensions. to exceed a total of mm -hmm. X. Or exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, and I wouldn't be against, I think, what Craig said. If we switch the time frame so the planning commission can go up to a year sure. and it can only go six, six months. months, because if it's truly a construction delay, yeah, it should only be like. It really shouldn't be that long. Month. They're they're pretty close at that point, I would think. So it may may have to pair the question of what kind of delays would go to the planning commission versus the director, and then set the time extension according to that. Yeah. yeah. It it does say though the director could give an extension or approval for no more than one year. So you could say, I'll give you three months, or I'll give you true six months. You don't so, have yeah, to give them a full yeah. year. Same with the planning commission too. I would presume. I mean, if they come in and ask for a year, you could. Uh, the planning months. commission could say nine months. Six if, months. if we word it that way, right now the way it's worded, it's worded it just says way. grant uh, one six-month extension and one, then yeah, the second. On, on the, and the, and the, the director, it says no more than so he could. Yeah, but uh, and and my point is is that overall with the various extensions, et cetera, what is the no more total? Like, do we want total. to keep something open for two years, three years, whatever? So it's. Maybe three months here, might be nine months there, but it's what is the max we'll ever extend? Hmm. I mean, you, you have to start thinking about what the the purpose of having the time limit in the first place, right. I mean, the extension. Right. And I, I I can think of two. Number one, you don't want to have an empty operation or an operation that's undergoing constant remodeling for two years, three years. Uh, the other one is conditions may have changed. The reasons, the circumstances under which we granted the conditional use in 2010 may have changed if he gets a 
accumulated two or three year extension. Yeah, my point is it's less important to say that we only have 12 months and, and the director has six months, but it's more important to know what's the absolute total. And three years is probably too long, I would say. Thanks, so. Mm -hmm. Unless somebody can come up with a set of circumstances that would could right. conceivably justify it. Right. And Please. it's not like it's a done it's dead after that period. They just I mean, they make a reapplication. They have to make a new application and go through the process again. So it's it's not like they can ever ever you know have no, to do it. If, if our goal is to try and anticipate reasonable circumstances and try and facilitate the process to keep business flowing, then it's worth reevaluating which body grants extensions of how long and for what reasons, so that there's clarity on where the, the applicant has to go. So this relates to the time that they need to get it, the operation going? or Is there a timeline once it's going, how long it's granted to be uh, held? The only, the only conditional use we have that has a timeline that has to come back for renewal is the correctional facilities. And it's every five years for them for renewal. But the rest of them, it, it's binding with the land. And so it just falls under, you know, if an ownership changes and that use gets abandoned basically mm -hmm. for 12 months, then they lose their conditional use. So if the ownership changes but the use doesn't change, the conditional use it, exactly. extends. Exactly. Yes. How does something yes. like the, where does, the Marathon property was supposed to get developed and how many years has it passed? Does that, was the, that falling under this? No, it's, it's not a PD zoning, zone. Uh, which didn't have a time limit on it. The conditional use was what, the, the daycare center or the, the shopping center? center? Just, actually, and that's an example of one that went with the land because he mm. didn't originally have that daycare. That daycare approval happened in 1979. Mm -hmm. They buy the, they buy the, the, the use with the building, and they don't change, they operate under those conditions that have approved, and they continue it, and it, you know, 12 months doesn't lapse. You know, then they keep that keeps running with the land. Since we're we're talking about Graham's creative kits, I'd like to ask a question for clarification of something in my own mind. He had was using one part of the uh, shopping center for the uh, child care center and was going to expand and put some outdoor space in and that sort of thing. And I think the intent was he was shutting down the one part while he was remodeling everything. If he was doing joined, you know, conjoined facilities, could continue operating under the original facility for which the conditional use was granted, would he have to, would, would a delay in the, in the completion of the second facility affect his conditional use on the first one? Well, that's... Well, cause, because the, the part of the property that he was expanding his conditional use in, which would basically be that new use in that former restaurant or whatever, that that wasn't going to be, op his operation wasn't going to be taking place in that part of it within the time frame. Okay, so a delay there, as we, yeah. as we dealt with, wasn't affecting his, his ongoing operation? No, okay. no. No, no, and frankly, to tell you the truth, I... This is, I think, the only time I've ever had a conditional use time extension in front of the Planning Commission. There might have been one other time in the last 20 years, but I honestly I can't recall. So it's not something that in the past has happened much now. I don't know. That may be different down the road, you know, with the economy and everything. But It'll be nice to know that this time we're, we're clarifying things for yeah, another 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just to wrap up the discussion on the time extension, I think I generally heard agreement that um, we should extend the planning commission to more, no more than a year extension to give us flexibility in establishing that time as well. But I'd still like to urge that staff decide what the circumstances are to determine whether it goes to the planning commission. And I was going to say, and, and to clarify, clarify that, and also put a cumulative time of no more than a year cumulative, I think. And I'd be open to hearing if planning commission has to approve it. Like what, what types of exceptions come into play that it has to go to planning commission could it be all mm. go by director okay we just if, if we're evaluating that and having to define it we may find that it doesn't have to come to us and i've got one more question under appeals right now we're saying the appeal request should be placed on you know after it's gone through whichever hearing it has to planning commission or the, or the uh, director the appeal has to be placed on the agenda of the city council within 90 calendar days after receipt of the written appeal. Is that, is that such a long time that it might be considered obstructive for somebody who's trying to get a business?
plan moving? Kurt, do you see any potential hang-ups on financing for something like that? Is 90 days? I don't think 90 days is a, a time frame. It says no more than. It's so within, it 90. Could be right. within 90. It could be 30. Um, in, you know, in the middle of, of the summer or something, maybe I mean, hard to get something that, like that. That within 90 days is actually the actual limit that that's keeping them from waiting 100 for us waiting 120 days or something i mean it can be put on the agenda earlier than that i guess i was just trying you know the the, the genesis for this was the, the, the frequent requests from people throughout the community to try and streamline the process make it more predictable make it easier to get through i'm just wondering is is 90 days too far out of target to shoot for is it reasonable to expect that even under the most extreme circumstances uh we could to be able to get it to the council 45 or 60 days is this um, kind of a standard language we well, use on a, other yeah appeals? standard language has been elsewhere in the code that's why i think that's where i think that's in um i mean i think it might be in chapter seven right now on site plan appeals to planning commission in a 90-day period how I many times does council that. meet that they could see something like this too they only meet three six times. six, six times. Times. potentially even if it's every other month Every other meeting, that's at least three times they would have changed it. Potentially oh. three times. Yeah, that's that's consistent with the appeals for site plans. If you're, if you're pursuing an appeal, it's on the applicant's own, uh, responsibility to submit it as soon as they can. Well, no, this is talking about staff putting it on the agenda for city council. Uh, After the appeal's yeah, already they been. They have to, to within 10 days, submit to us. But that date's right. It's, we have 90 days to put it on a council agenda. Okay. I'd well, just like to suggest if it's not unreasonable to tighten that up. I'd second the intents of that, that, that if it is possible and if it's not scope creep to this project, and maybe it is indeed something else, uh, that the intent is to absolutely shorten this process. And if 90 days can be 60 for the sake of being 60, then I'd rather see that. And, and if you want to do that, then I, then I what I also need to do is I like to keep it consistent. Yeah. So I'll, I'll add in changing that in Chapter 7 for the site plan. And I wouldn't push you to blind consistency, Jan. I mean, if, if under a, a different procedure, there might be more hang-ups that, would, that would, could conceivably cause the process I, to get... Actually, I think it's uh, getting something on your agenda within 90 days is easier than getting something on the council agenda with 90 days. And the site plan appeal is going to you guys. So I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't see a... I personally think about it just make them both consistent anyway, but that would be. I'm, I'm just trying to nudge it yeah. toward expediency on the. Plan. Yeah, well, I understand that. 90 days is a long time. <laughs> Sometimes it's the applicant who wants time to well, build a case. Well, we had we so. had that situation with the Jiffy Loop thing that went to you guys because um, they actually they filed their appeal within 10 days, and then they it happened to be over the holiday period, and they weren't going to be available. To, right. to get it on to you guys all that soon, so th that's when Has that, this created a problem yeah. in the past? We've hardly ever had these. I, I Honestly, I don't even know when we had an appeal, conditional use appeal. We really get, very rarely get appeals. But. So we're covering ourselves for another 20 years. That's good. Yeah, see, and I'll be in the nursing home by then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. We approve it. Yeah, that's why you can do it already right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll time it. Yeah, that new Alzheimer's. Did you forget it all? We'll be calling Jan to the witness stand. <laughs> she gets 90 days notice. Jan, I have, um, I have more of a question. So both in um, 11, oh, I just mixed up my numbers. Um, maybe now. So in ch chapter 2, 11-2, Dash two, and in another section that I will find, um, chapter eight, ten dash eight dash four. M my question was just: there's a lot of stuff that you took out because it's going in the operating um, standards, but then there's still stuff you kept in. So how do you decide or discern what stays in versus well, out? I, you know, I, I like leaving some of the, 
you know, what, what I was really taking out was a lot of like the plant, the stuff that goes, the information that goes on the plans, you know, whether it's the plaid or the PD plan or that little checklist of, you know, the North Arrow and the dates and all that mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and other information that actually ends up being on an application form that they fill out. Okay. Um, stuff like, the, you know, stuff, the, the items like the current title commitment, the drainage study, some of those documents. Um, I personally, from my own experience professionally doing this for many years, I'd like to leave those in the code because I have I've had to argue with people about submitting those things. And it's a lot easier to, especially like with the current title commitment. You know, I would get people, oh, well, why can't I just submit a deed? Why can't I just submit a copy of my deed? And they don't understand that that's really not a proof of ownership because that just proves that they owned the house or the property in 1985 when the deed, you know, when they have the deed. It doesn't, the title commitment actually shows that they still own the house. It shows that there's a mortgage or a lien on the house, or not the house, but the property. And um, so that there's some, and same with like the drainage study. I mean, we do get some people that argue about having to submit those things and, and and, you know, it just gives, it gives the staff a little bit better teeth to get those submitted if they're in the code versus, you know, this little checklist that, that includes other little information for a plat or something. So that's, that's my reason for wanting to leave these in the code. I mean, it's, it's duplicated. It will also be in operating standards, so they have that all, you know, comprehensive list for ease. But And I think we talked about this last time as well is, um, if, if this is the operating standard and all of the documentation you have to submit in order to follow the process, then that's what that is. If this is the code and, and you're requiring here certain items because that's part of the original form, because it's necessary for then you to evaluate and make sure it's falling under the right criteria, I just want to be consistent of form of what this is intended to be and how it's used versus this. And so what I'm hearing you say is there, there's some cases where you want to put in the code to help reinforce it. Cause, right. Because if we say that, then I guess I come back to then how do you enforce anything that's in here? If we should be able to enforce I mean, this should be the well, And we refer to it, right? We say yeah, we do. in the code we say it's based on the operating um, standard. So that in and of itself, I think, reinforces the actions that we're asking here. So perhaps yeah. in the checklist... It's not an option in the operating standard. It's a required thing. Yeah. And it's supported by the reference in the code that you must follow the operating standard. Right, right, right. Well, I, you know, I haven't had a chance to talk to Kirsten about that to, to make sure that, that this, this, this language saying that they have to follow within the operating standards because that's all the meat we need. I, you know, that would, if so, then that, yeah, that's fine with me. That would simplify this. Mm -hmm. That was just my only concern was to make sure that we had that. But if, you know, if we do, then that's great. I thought originally the motivation for pulling things out of the ordinance where they couldn't be changed without a, an ordinance revision, action by city council, to putting, putting them in, some of them into the operating standards is so that we didn't have to worry as technology changed, that we, if we started going to electronic transfer documents instead of printed documents and the size of documents or the, or the software being used, those administrative, those housekeeping details could be changed administratively without requiring an ordinance change. But it looks like now we're doing a wholesale transfer of all these requirements into an administrative package that could be changed by staff without having to take it to planning commission, city council, or anybody. Isn't that going a little farther than what we talked about? Putting an awful lot of, of authority over what shall be submitted in the hands of staff? Well, we can go either way. I, I can see the criticism of your duplicating information, and, and believe me, that's a goal that we're trying to get away from. Um, and through Jan's experience, she knows those things that are important that sometimes people push back on because they cost money, like a title report. Um, and that would certainly seem to constitute a definition of the things that should stay in the ordinance. So it has the authority of ordinance and can't be changed. And nobody can, can say, oh, I'm, you know, Mr. Director, why won't you listen to me? Be reasonable. Relax this a little bit. You can very easily say, 
sorry, that's in the ordinance. We'd have to get city council action, whereas opposed to something that's housekeeping, sure, we can be flexible on that. I don't really see as big of a problem a lot of the items in the operating um, uh, standards are more uh, documents, formatting, process of, you know, what kind of fees and applications need to be submitted. They're not health, what is it, health safety welfare issues that a zoning ordinance tends to want to focus on in terms of, you know, zoning uh, height, bulk, density, things like that, that really shape a character of a community. These don't shape the character of a community. They, they more shape how a, a submittal process is going to be administered. Um, I don't know if they're going to get into a big battle. I do have a question about one item, and that is the current title commitment. What is current? You know, a lot of places will say within 30 days or, or uh, they give it, they give it a, a date to make it. Um, you, know, you could argue that a current title commitment is 90 days, but you could sell the property in 90 days. You have a good point because our current code doesn't doesn't specify it, right. and staff's been, you know, the city attorney and staff has been kind of, you know, using their best judgment on that. You know, like I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen 30 days. 30 days as is current. typically what we've used. But I see the operating standards as more administrative processing of documents and not a you know, shaping the character of the, of the submittal. Yet I wonder, to, to Dave's point, um, for instance, on, um, I guess it's 11-2, gosh, two procedures where we have a subdivision plat shall be on 24-inch by 36-inch paper. So, you know, it, you're prescribing a the format paper. for submittal in the code, whereas you know, it's that type of thing that I would expect to see in the operating standards because it could be changed depending on a PDF submittal or you know something electronic submittals. Or. Okay, that's a good, that's a good that's a good catch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really wasn't interested in trying to go down the list and say this ought to go here, that ought to go there. I just I, I thought maybe if we step back and and looked at the organizing principle, things that are essential. To the review that you don't want to be subject to administrative revision you need to stay in the ordinance and Kirsten may reinforce that or redefine that one way or another whereas things that are just housekeeping or format uh, yeah put it in the operating procedures if that changes from year to year no big deal mm -hmm. but the, the basic factors that, that should be that the city and city council city staff intends to be included with each of these applications be specified in the ordinance. We do run the risk if we have it located twice that five, ten years down the road, one changes, the other doesn't. That, that could be that actually, <laughs> actually three times because yeah. some place in here is also a reference telling them to go look in the uh, for requirements in the city charter. So there you go. You could you could be doing a round robin of tours with all your which which again <laughs> it's kind of out out of sequence, but. That, that kind of seems to be defeating the purpose of trying to make things easier if we're creating not just a second, but a third place to go to look for requirements. It's, would, it's would, more onerous for the applicant. I would agree that if you want it to have teeth, you need to have it in code. Unless legally by referring to the operating standards. And, and it's may, it may be how we word, word it too. But. Yeah, but, but they're really right about the one, about legally having it in the code. But the other one is, if it's something so essential it really needs to be in there, don't make it subject to administrative change. Yeah. Leave it to council to change. Could we ask that the uh, operating standards, if they're going to be changed by some renegade senior planner down the road, be subject to After the plan retires and goes yeah, to the new uh, 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 know, Could we have it that uh, major changes or any changes are subject to planning commission review? Well, that, or is that getting too tedious I, for us? I think that was the goal. The goal of having the operating standards was to alleviate a lot of that chasing back and forth. I just I think maybe we need to rethink what ought to take review by city council or planning commission versus what's just day-to-day -day administrative stuff. 
We can live up, leave up to professional staff. I'm trying to trace that through how that might impact us in, in hearings down the road. I think that's a good, good point. You know, say, say the operating standards were completely changed for the benefit of, of staff expediency or whatever, that what we see when we review the plans has to be coherent and understandable and logical and you know, as, as long as that continues to happen and there's some sort of guarantee in the process that we're going to be able to do our jobs or whoever the planning commissioners in 20 years I, I, are. No, I, I don't see that being a problem because you, I, you should see some of what, well, what you guys get in front of you at a hearing for a project is not what comes in the door. Begin with, well, oh, wait me, I have, <laughs> after 20 check friends, you know, you guys finally get something sometimes, in some cases, it's like that, so. I think the, so if I understand this correctly, then, again, the code is saying what, um, what, what type of information needs to be available, not necessarily how that information is obtained. That's where this comes into play. So for, for our responsibility, or staff's responsibility to us, when they present to us is, is it including all of the information that you need to make a decision based on the code? The how it gets compiled, put together, whatever documentation, I don't know that we need to, other than knowing that it's valid, certifiable, and all of those things that make it. Mm -hmm. The other way to look at it is, is with the new provision, same as with the existing, there is language in the uh, in the ordinance that allows staff to require or request more information as needed. So if staff wants to add information, they can do that whether it's listed in here or listed in the operating standards. What I'm really trying getting at is there ought to be some things that are required by code and nobody can make a staff decision and say, ah, no, you don't need that. That, that should be the, the dividing line between in the code operating standards. Yeah, and I think one thing, I mean, one of our requirements is make sure the owner that we're, is requesting the rezoning is the owner. So, I mean, that's kind of a basic thing that we have to be assured of. So perhaps the ownership part in the title report needs to stay in the ordinance as a kind of a minimum. I would challenge that because if this just reads proof of ownership, then however you want to define how you get that proof of ownership is here. Mm -hmm. But you, I mean, your responsibility to us is that you've done your diligence to show proof of ownership. Yeah. You guys can think about it. Mm -hmm. You'll whatever way. <laughs> I mean, there, there could also be a middle ground where you actually state a little bit more teeth that, um, Ownership shall be proven per the standards uh, listed in the operating manual, or something along that line. So you, you're putting a little bit more teeth into what's in the operating manual. Um, and then one thing we can do is perhaps report to you as changes are made. Maybe it's a, a yearly report if we make changes to the operating standards or something. That it's a report to you that this is what changed and why. Or But again, I think the ownership part, the city attorney might have a more conservative view of that. Is it, maybe it is something better. Maybe we come up with something better than a title report. I don't know. But I like the idea. I mean, the ownership one is, a, is an obvious one. You've got to have proper ownership proven by an applicant. But other things like drainage reports, traffic studies, lighting, View sheds, whatever it is. Um, not every project, even though it may say it, not every project may require it or need it. And so you have to have the ability to say you really don't need the traffic study. The project's too small, even though it's a general item under the checklist. Some projects just don't warrant a, a traffic study. All the more reason for an applicant to be able to get a list saying mm -hmm. these things are absolutely required. These things may be required as appropriate to the project. Right. 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 Whatever. Right. I mean, the thing that, that 
impelled this a long time ago was trying to expedite things trying to improve predictability to guarantee equity instead of differential handling from one applicant to the next i think if we lose sight of that at any step of the way we're making a mistake we will mull it and bring it back <laughs> Chapter 9, 10-9-5, uh, um, uh, item G, parking garages and lots. The added wording may be permitted as a principal use. Oh, um, because that was just a... Chapter 9, chapter 9, 10-9-5, G. I just put, I just suggested that as a clarification, because that's that's what that's what it is intended is that if an automobile parking garage or a lot is a parking, is the principal use on that is a parking lot or a parking garage, then it then it has to go to a PD overlay. And it as a really standalone use. As a standalone use, use yeah. And it, it never it never actually clarified that that's what it meant, but that's what it meant. So I just, as I'm going through, I just thought I would That's exactly that. why I asked, because as, as I read it as a clarification, right. it led me to believe that um, it was not for principal use in the past and just in, no, in it, conjunction it always, with something always, else. No, it was always the intent. It's, in conjunction with something else, it's an accessory use. So... Of course, you know, an office building, which is a permitted use in the B1 district, having a parking lot is, there, is accessory to that. This is, this is when parking garages or and lots are the principal use of that property. Yeah, I think that's a good clarity. Okay. So I was just clarifying something. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that falls under development standards. Doesn't that, aren't development standards, setbacks, open space, why is use under development standards? Well, it's it's well actually the 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 use table in chapter three lists parking garages and lots as a is a principal use in these zone districts as a PD overlay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then this section has special standards for that PD overlay, that type of PD overlay. If you're looking at a PD overlay for a parking lot. Oh, okay. Which you guys have done that because Brandon Dodge had that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you weren't on the council right. planning commission at the time, but Brandon Dodge had had that in front of the planning commission. And, and for parking lots and parking garages, there are specific there are some specific uh, architectural uh, specific standards for that you're looking at for that. So, so ten dash nine dash five is for a specific use? Well, the, the, well, see, what I, I probably shouldn't have done this, but see, the, the use table in Chapter 3 identifies that parking garage and lots as a principal use are permitted in those three zone districts, but they require a PD overlay for that approval, okay? Mm -hmm. And then this is the chapter that you're looking at. Here's the development standards for PD overlays, okay? Right. And this... G is just is just specifying the specific development standards that are applied to a PD overlay for a parking <coughs> garage or a lot. Okay. And I just added that as a principal use just for clarification, you know, just because it didn't really just to make it just to clarify it to be consistent with how it's listed in the use table. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah, I think you said that these ordinances are, are very old. So they're organized a little differently. Well, they, they, they are. And, and, yeah. <laughs> well, don't, don't take that too far. They, we've had revisions to the ordinances coming at us every six months for the last yeah. five years I've been on. So oh, okay. presumably it's, they've been accumulating over the years. Mark, same thing when you were first on? No? Yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> yes. Good old days. You picked the right 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a, a just a question on for a subdivision 
um, final plat checklist. And I just. Which chapter? Uh, actually, it's in all the subdivisions, but um, it would be major subdivision final plat, page 104. Um, so you're looking at the operation. Oh, the operation. Standards. Yeah, the operation. Um, sorry. The uh, operation manual, major subdivision plats, and it's also in the minor and the subdivision exemption map. Um, what is the, uh, there's a letter of intent detailing the cash payment of land dedication or any combination of cash or land to be donated to the city to fulfill the requirements of the city's subdivision regulations. And I was curious if you could um, tell more on how that's, what's that, what that is used for. That's well, a cash payment or land dedication? Yeah, that's, that's, um, there's, um, Chapter 7 of the subdivision regulations deals with land dedication and payment of fees. And there's, there's a park fee, I mean, for residential development. They, they're either required to dedicate land for park use or pay park fee per unit. That's for residential. Um, for commercial, they're required to pay a public facilities fee when they plat property. Okay. And all this is is just, this is actually old language. It comes off these old checklists from years past. But that's just, it's just there is the applicant's letter of intent detailing, you know, that they'll be paying either the cash payment or the land, or there'll be land dedication required. It'd actually those. be kind of nice to just say that this would be going towards uh, park property or helping the city expand the park property or just just so that there's an understanding when I, when looking through that, of you know, what is the the value I added to the city? Fulfill the requirements of the subdivision regulations. Yes, just just so that that's a value added to the community, and if that's the only requirement, subdivision. Otherwise, this is attempting to cover not just park dedications, but anything else that's required. Stormwater retention. Well, that's true. It could be a school yeah, fee. That's true. This is an umbrella. It's, it's, not, it's an it's umbrella, not, okay. right? Because there yeah, could be some other right-of-way dedications and things yeah. like that. Okay, I was just curious. So um, you can buy your way out of meeting regulations? No. no. Yeah, entirely. But you can you that's part of the regulations. I was afraid to say that out loud. Actually, you know, the way it formulates is like a lot of development. I mean, I've had some developments I've worked on that took, took parkland dedication instead because of the size of the properties. But, but you can get a, a property that's, you know, a residential property that's going to be maybe platting five lots and there's not enough they don't they don't have enough land to really be dedicating to the park for a park so in that particular situation they would pay a, a cash fee in lieu of and that cash fee actually can be used towards maintaining or making improvements to a nearby park can be used but not required to be used I think it, it, it is prescribed. It is, it's yeah. prescribed to be used, yes. Yeah. For some public purpose. It just may not be. I, give, I think an example would be in the 70s and 80s when there were still residential developments going on in Littleton. Usually they were required to set aside land for a school. And LPS a long time ago said, we don't need any more land for schools. So in that case, there would be no point in the, in the developer donating the land for a purpose to which it's not going to come to be used. Let's look at some other public purpose that can be it, achieved through a land, another land transfer or a cash payment. And a lot of, um, actually it's kind of funny because our code used to specify that it could only be used for future acquisitions for park. And, um, and more recently when we amended the subdivision regulations to establish a, a different park fee for like a senior facility, I don't know if you remember that. It came up. Um, we also amended the subdivision regulation to allow park fees to be used for maintenance and improvements of existing parks instead of just only for acquisition. And frankly, South Suburban, you know, on probably most every project I've sent to them, um, they'll, their response back will always be they, they're requesting that the city require the park fee because in, in most cases there's already plenty of land and park dedicated out there, but it still needs improving, you know. And these residents for this development are going to be using Harlow Park or whatever, you know. So. When did the use of those funds uh, change uh, definition? Oh. oh. How long ago? 
Probably it was since I've been it's on planning commission, so maybe three ago. years. It, it actually it happened because um, this, the spec, spectrum that rezoned the property on Broadway for a senior assisted living facility. It, it happened after that because um, we were struggling with well, what type of park fee do we charge <laughs> the assisted living facility because they're not, you know, they're residential, but blah blah, and so um, that's when uh, we looked into modifying that. Doing is uh, not charging them what an apartment you development would pay, but a different type of use given the seniors. And, and that so that's when we looked at that definition right. and, and the requirement for the acquisition thing. So that all got amended under the planning way. commission uh, uh, item, or did it go to council? Oh, it went to it went to planning commission that too because it was yeah. a change to the sub reg. And actually, I have the ordinance right here, so I can tell you it was 2009. We talked about it as part of the application. Yeah, but it did go to council. Yeah, it, did, it, went, it went as a separate ordinance. But going back to the example of, say, a five-lot subdivision, the, the amount of land that might be dedicated for parkland in there is often so small that it's really no, unusable. No, exactly, and, exactly. And, you know, that's the purpose of parks master plans, that mo most cities do have these dedicate or the uh, fee in lieu of mm -hmm. dedication. Do you keep yeah. track of that amount? How much? We budget for it, and it's in the budget. Sure, there's a self-appointed ombudsman out there someplace who's making sure that it gets used for that public purpose. Now, a place like the Marathon site, they, they have, have a, dedication, right? That, or, that's a possibility with that one because that, you know, the previous the the plat that did get reviewed and approved by planning commission and expires since, of course, it had about a three-acre park proposed in the center, and whether that was going to take care of their entire obligation, I don't know, because we never got as far as the final plat and really doing some formulas. But that that uh, could be definitely a parkland dedication. And, you know, really, it's, it takes a pretty big development. I mean, Trailmark was one of them. Um, actually, one of the last ones I had was the, the Sunset um, subdivision that was, you know, Jackass Hill. Um, that that took that did land dedication too, but a lot of the infill ones we've had mostly are small enough that they just there wasn't enough land to really warrant just being parked, so they do pay the fees. But. Okay. One last thing, I, I know the whole mobile home park thing is really in Chapter Two, and we'll mm -hmm. talk about that in the next regular meeting. But we are deleting the reference in Chapter Nine where it says that any change in density or permitted uses uh, will require the PDO procedure for every zone except, it says, mobile home district. My question is, if we're deleting that district and somebody two years from now comes in and wants to put in a mobile home park, where do we point them as far as the requirements for, for rezoning to a mobile home district that no longer exists in Chapter 2? Yeah, that's the ultimate issue, and, and I guess we're saying we create the standards with a with a plan development, just like anybody would use. And I don't want to get too much okay. right into that, but if we end up keeping the mobile home, we will put that back in. Not for now. We'll keep where it is. Or else, yeah, that's it. Were there any other questions or comments on the code revisions? Okay. Doing a chapter by chapter. Did um, did we want to go? Well, I think uh, Jan has given us an overview. If there's any specific comments, I don't I don't know if we want to go chapter by chapter through all these comments. Um, anything that we should pay special attention to, or um, well, one thing I I will like to point out um, that in the uh, um, the zoning code, um, there's, there's been the provision for, and it's also in the plat too, uh, the uh, requirement that a plat or a PD plan or a PD overlay be recorded within a year of the approval to maintain their approval, you know, basically. And um, I did, I did take, I, I've added something in the, oper I think I took that out of there, put it in the operating standards. And um, to address some of this, this time extension stuff and being a little bit friendlier to folks, um, 
I did add a provision in there for uh, place where time extensions could be administratively approved on those items. Um, let me. Get where was it before in the code? Um, it was in um, just a sec here. Chapter nine probably has it in there. Oh, um, just a second. Help me look at this, this one, the original one. A weird place. Originally, and that's why I always have a hard time finding it. See it in chapter one. Okay, it's in, okay, in the zoning code. Now, see, you may not, if um, it would have been in 1019E. And it just, it based, it, that's the original, that's what got changed in 1996. That's what was added to the code in 1996. Um, where it says all general PD plans, PDOs, final PD plans, and SDPs shall be recorded and um, And must be recorded like within one year. Otherwise, um, they re they become null and void and have to be restored by formal action by the council or the planning commission. And um, do our plans have vesting? Well, the way the the way way the code is now is that, and we never had anybody do it. There is a provision in the code for applying for vested rights. Well, how long is a plat valid after it's approved and recorded? It's forever. Yeah, right so now, really both, yeah, platting and PDOs and PD plans are, once they're recorded, that entitlement's they, there. They don't have to construct. I guess maybe I'm thinking of something different. Is there anything that has a, an expiration on it, like a zoning a, a document? Um, or? The only thing, the only thing that does zoning. right now is like a site development plan. Because if they record a site development plan, even within a year after it's approved, they have to pull a per building permit okay. within that year. What about preliminary, is a preliminary year. plat? Uh, does that expire? That expires. Okay, that's what I'm thinking yeah. about then. There are several, there are several yeah. that, that are sunsetted, even though we went Because they're not completed. They're still in the process. If they're given a time limit. If, it is, if action isn't taken, right. and sometimes it's building permit applied for, sometimes it's started construction. But there are time limits. Right. Okay. On which they have to reapply. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what I did, I mean, that's that's what the code says now. They have a year to report it, otherwise. And so what I've changed in these operating standards is is a um, the ability for them to ask for a time extension. I have here an extension of approval for no more than one year may be granted by the director of community development. And provide a written request for. Time extension is filed within the planning division prior to the date of expiration. So that's that's something that I've added in here that may be of interest to you all. That, that, so that, that, that begs an interesting years, question. So yeah. Two years total. Yeah. Why would they wait? Why? Uh, so that and so why are why do some things have an expiration and some don't? So why would it be okay to uh, approve a PDO and let it sit for 20 years? Things change in 20 years. We tried to ask that question a year ago. This came up. It did. Yeah, it did. And we were told by council and city attorney's office, oh, you can't sunset. It's all over the code. What's all over the code? Sunsetting. If you don't have, if you haven't, if you get approval for X and you haven't taken the following action within 12 months, that approval is null and void and you have to reapply. Hmm. What, what, what bothers me a little bit is the idea that we're taking it out of the code and putting it into operating procedures that can be modified, and I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, willy-nilly by staff. It takes predictability out. It takes equity out. It, it just if we're going to have if we're going to have those kinds of deadlines, they ought to be in code. They ought to require for, city council approval. For example, zoning has to run with the land. You can't you can't sunset zoning. But a PDO is a rezone. 
Technically? We've, we had that debate. We had that earlier, debate, too. That, that's the way it came down. That a PDO is a rezoning, and you can't change that without going Yeah, PDO is a zone district. Well, so a PDR, a PDI, a PDC is a zone district. A PDO is a process. It's a process. It's not really a rezoning. It's a modification. It's somewhere between a plan development plan and, a, and an, an actual plan, a PD district. But I think we've been told don't go there. <laughs> well, we get, what, what I'm saying is we're there. We're there in the existing ordinance now. All that's happening with this is all of those sunset requirements, those deadlines, are being moved from the ordinance, which would require city council action to change, into the operating procedures, which can be done, again, it keeps sounding, sounding wrong, by some future development planning or development board that uh, isn't as diligent as others. I guess I would agree that if we're talking about expirations on, on timelines that developers rely upon or count upon, either through their pro formas or their bank requirements. If it's not enforced by zone or by the code, we could get in trouble um, not being consistent. If things expire and we just kind of add another couple months administratively, but we don't do it for the next guy the same way, that starts messing with, uh, you know, obligations of, with developers and owners and Predictability. Yeah. And it's not like developers aren't used to do it, dealing with that with yeah. construction loans and that's probably should look at it at least and see where it's occurring. So that's site development plan, preliminary plats. Are there any things with uh, deadlines on them? No. No, I well no, they all had deadlines on them. Preliminary plats have a deadline on them. All of them do. The final plat, the P D plans, the PDLs, the site development plans, conditional uses. But do they have sunset? Can you tell you they have it's, a deadline? They have well, sunset. sunset, they just have deadlines to be approved. To be I mean, approved. to be recorded after they're approved. To be recorded but, after they're approved. Yeah. But I think once they're we're, recorded, we're, then they're approved they're forever. forever. Yeah. Unless the, somebody the standard changes. language in the, in the zoning ordinance as well as in the subdivision is if an approved, whatever, is not recorded within one year from the date of approval, the approval will come null and void. The approved plat may be restored only by formal action of city council unless a time extension is granted. That's not verbatim in every case, but generally that's what it says in each of those cases. Which I would agree with. If, you, if you're not acting upon your approved mm -hmm. plat, then it goes away. But it has to be in the code to say, sorry, it's in the code. It's gone. So you're suggesting that it gets out of, well, it gets put back in the code and out of the operating standard. That kind of a deep inspiration, I would think, has to have teeth. And the proposal for an administrative time extension, is that causing you guys some angst on that? I mean, that could be put back in the code, too, with it. it. I just was wondering. They may have to go together just because it's a package uh -huh. deal. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's something uh -huh. Kirsten's going to have to answer. And it may, again, go back to an administrative extension under the following circumstances or because of the following reasons. You know, so that it's so there's a again predictability and equity there is to under what circumstances this person could it, would get it, somebody else might not. It, it, it could still be the same language, just in a different place. Um, same process. Um, because this operating standards to me seems to be mostly getting to that point. Finally, you've got your approval. Now we're talking about, uh, well, it's kind of operating, but it still is a, it's a, it's a, an approval that if, it's, if it is expired and they start to complain and get their lawyers out and say, you know, it's not in the code, you know, how can you enforce it that we have to, that, you, that you're going to uh, let this expire, we're going to fight you. I, I tend to line. agree. I think that those types of timelines should be yeah. in this um, in the code, and some of them are. So I think it's just a matter of consistency. I'm just going to fiddle my way down through the chapters. In Chapter 11, where we're getting rid of the 10-day uh, notice before the public hearing date, it references as per state law and. Uh, in the operating standards. 
operating standards right now say 10 days before the public hearing. It's the same thing that the ordinance says. What does state law say? Again, what I'm getting at is if we're putting this in the operating standards with the understanding that the minimum 10-day requirement for getting a public notice before the public hearing is going to be carried over into the operating standards, that's fine now. Five years from now, if somebody changes it, they can do that without going to city council. So the state law requirements would seem to be a backup for that, but I couldn't find what state law says about it. Where are you? It's Chapter 11, page 2, where we deleted most of lines 4 to 6 and put in, notice of a public hearing should be provided by the city and the applicants prescribed by state law and in the operating standards. So the operating standards could be administratively, that time period could be administratively adjusted. Is there some minimum standard in state law that would override that so nobody could reduce it two days or anything like that? I think what we are trying to say is the form of the posting would have to be how we, and we should probably clarify that. So it wouldn't change the time limit. Right now it does. That's why I raised the question. Yeah. But it's what the sign shall look like and what it shall say on the sign, I think, is what we have moved into the operating standards. So are we eliminating the time limit then, or would that time limit then appear? No, no, it's still in the 10 days. I just need to clarify it, that the per state law goes with actually the posting. It's what the sign is. Because it's the posting requirements for the state law. I think it's just like a notification type sign. You don't have to actually, I mean, you see other jurisdictions that just say, notice of public hearing, call such and such a number. You know, I mean, that's basically kind of all we're required to put on there. We actually put more on our signs than state law requires. But there is a strike through on the 10 calendar days. I'm having a hard time. Where are you again? Am I in the wrong? It's 10-11. Chapter 2. Page 2. Right at the top there. So does the city post the sign? No, the applicant does. Notice of public hearing shall be provided by the city. That's the notice. They put it in the ground, right? Right. We make the sign and they put it in the ground. They put it in the ground. And also there's other notice, too. We don't, it's not just the notice of, it's not just the sign. You do a newspaper notice. We do. Well, we used to do newspaper, but now we do the website and we post it at the city building and the library and the courthouse. Okay, so I think I see what you're saying. The reference to state law is what's required of the sign. Yeah. Okay. What would be in the operating standards is both what's required of the sign and how many days before the hearing has to be posted. Right. Clarifying that would be helpful. But my concern here is making sure that, how do I put this, that we don't have somebody coming along somewhere in the future saying, oh, we don't need more than 48 hours notice put up before a hearing. If it's 10 days, if it's 10 days in the ordinance, if 10 days seems to be a reasonable time period to give the neighbors a chance to react and come to the hearing, I'd like to see that fixed, not subject to. I don't think that was our intent was to mess with the time. No, I was planning on leaving it 10 days like it's always been. My experience is that postings can make or break a case. Yeah. And so it better be clear to the applicant what they're expected to do. And if you get in the hearing and the attorney or whoever says it was proper notification conducted and somebody says, no, it wasn't, you better be able to defend it with a code. It better be in the code versus just in administrative papers because that will make a developer go through the roof. Their fault, but. This is specific to variances, and I imagine that's more of a general comment with respect to any type of hearings. Where else would that appear? In Chapter 1? Yeah, it appears in Chapter 1. And it 
See, and I have here in the operating standards, I've got, you know, public hearing notice, at least 10 calendar days prior to the public hearing date. Notice of the public hearing shall be posted <coughs> on the property, shall be published. And on the posting, I put posting shall be by sign or signs which will be provided by the city. The applicant shall pay a deposit equal to the cost of the signs, blah, blah. And on each sign shall be erected in a conspicuous location on each public street. That's all out of the code. And um, that was in there before. And then I explained that the notice of the public hearing will be published by the city itself and posted at these three places. And the posted published notice reads and have the language for that. So I had that explained in the operating standards rather than having it. Yeah, I guess we were thinking that um, it's prescribed by state law. We couldn't necessarily change it without changing the charter or something to say. And, it, and if, if we're talking about time limits or minimum time posting in the state law, then yeah. And that's, I, I looked and I couldn't find anything. Well, they, I don't, they don't have that. I think it's just a matter that there has to be posting, there has to be notice posted. They don't state I don't think time. so. Because other, I mean, it did varies for jurisdiction. I mean, we used to, I mean, it used to be that city council's posting had to be 10 days and planning commission's posting in our code was 15 days. And then we went through and modified all that so everybody was the same. You know? If it were in state law, it would, A, give us that protection. It's, yeah. it's fixed. It can't be reduced. And it also means taking out of the code and saying, or as per state law, means if, if they change state law, we're covered. We don't have to change the ordinance. But in this case, it sounds like we're just sort of removing it, putting it into administrative or the operating procedures, which could be changed without any kind of notice. Yeah, I see them. But the, and the state law pertains to the way that the sign is displayed, not the time limit. I, I think we're seeing general agreement that we should include that 10 days time in back the in the ordinance. In the ordinance? Yeah. In the code? Yeah, I'm looking at page 28 in Chapter 1, which um, says public hearing notice. Notice of public hearing shall be provided by the city and applicant. The same language you had there. But, you know, simply adding yeah, at, at least 10 days. calendar days back in, I think, would be hard to miss. <laughs> yeah, because as a matter of fact, <clears throat> in Chapter 12, we do still have that 10 calendar day notice in the body of the code. That is being deleted there. Uh, so, so for consistency. I use the word. <laughs> I hate relying on the word consistency. But, yeah, yeah in this case, it seems like. Consistency translates to predictability, which we do want. Yeah, yeah. And in that sense, I, I like the word. It's, it's when people start using the same phrases, like consistent with such and such, when they try, they're trying to imply it's required by. And it, doesn't, it isn't really required by. It's just the same kind of language. Yeah, I appreciate the distinction. <laughs> Actually, Chapter 12 is where I found that, that uh, <clears throat> direction about having to follow the procedures in the ordinance and in the operating procedures and in the chart, which is chasing people hither and yon to try and get clear what their requirements are. So in, in Chapter 12, I had a couple questions. I think it could maybe be an educational moment for me and others. First of all, do we run into this um, mineral leases anymore? Or this, is that an issue no, that we should be concerned I, about? It's, it's actually, go again, I'm no city attorney here, but, um, you know, the city attorneys have, have advised us of the standard certifications and stuff that need to be provided. And I, and back when I had a case and I asked Suzanne about it when she was here because, I mean, I used to work for a jurisdiction in the county that we had oil wells and coal mines and stuff like that. And, and, and here, you know, most properties, I think, if they even had those minerals underneath them, would never be able to drill them out anyway because if the property is too small, they don't meet all those other restrictions that they have to have in order to drill them. But um, I was advised otherwise still that even though that's the case, we still have to do that. So. If Kurt and I had really been sharp, we'd have anticipated this question and look at our, looked at our own property documents. The area south of the canal in Southbridge and South Park were actually active mining sites years and years Probably, ago. Yeah. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that there, aren't, that there are separate mining rights 
with those properties or some of those. You properties. know, and actually some of the title commitments I've seen, like for Mission Hills Church, and that's that whole same area that you guys have yeah, the same commitments on. They had actually, there is like in 1958, I think, or no, 1970, in the 1970s, they recorded some document where they rescinded their right to, I mean, to actually enter on the property to extract the minerals. Of course, nowadays, I don't, you don't have to enter on the property anymore to extract the minerals. So I don't know what that's going to mean, Dave. You might have some fracking in your yard. I don't know. Yeah, and, and I don't, I don't, state law is going to uh, protect the homeowner um, the way the uh, merchant of Venice was pro prohibited from taking his pound of flesh if he took any, a drop of blood as well. I suspect state law is going to uphold the mineral rights regardless of what it does to the habitability of the property. But the, uh, it's that south part of town where you live is the only ones I've seen severed rights. And, and there, there is, they all, it was Union Pacific that owned them. And they have, uh, on those di title documents, they all have that recorded document in the 70s where they rescinded their right. And that, that was even but, more common, more prevalent in the area to the west of uh, South Platte Canyon Road, which yeah. fortunately is outside of Littleton. Yeah. But every, anything north of there, I never see any title commitments that show any suburb mineral rights on them. Mm. Yeah, it's one of those things. <laughs> most people, yeah. Mm -hmm. to me, but I was told not to have to go do that, so. All right. Did you have anything else? Uh, chapter 15, we're talking about lighting requirements. Um, Page two, talking about procedures for review, unique site conditions and that sort of thing. Uh, and the current code does empower the director of community, community development to, uh, to do that review. Um, we've stricken or we're proposing to strike out. It shall be at the director's discretion to consult with the development review committee as needed to determine if a modification meets the intent of this chapter. I, I, certainly the reference to DRC makes sense, but I'd suggest if we continued that first sentence where it says to the requirements of this chapter with if a modification meets the intent of this chapter, I'm sure that's the, the impl uh, implication. It would be nice to have it there in black and white. But now what did you, what was your change? Instead of deleting that whole sentence, mm -hmm. if you keep the, the phrase if a modification meets the intent of this chapter, again, I'm, we're giving, we're transferring a lot of discretion over to the uh, community development director, whoever he or she may be after everybody here is retired. Um, if you're transferring discretion or authority, it's nice to put some kind of definition or outline to that. In this case, the outline was, was assigned to, or the restriction was assigned to the DRC. I'd just like to see that continued with the if you'd like it to say, if a modification meets the intent of this chapter, the director may authorize. Yeah, the director may authorize. Yeah, just so continue well, that second that sentence. To the previous sentence. Right. right. So the director may authorize yeah. modification requirements. So your strike through would end it to determine. Meets the intent right. of this chapter. Right. Strike I think that was the intent anyway. It just it makes it clear. You follow that? The strike through would end it to determine. Oh. Okay. It's a good catch. That's all I had on the uh, zoning ordinance, but I did have some on the subdivision stuff. Go ahead. In Chapter 2, General Application Procedures on the first page, we've added Section B to 11.2.1, saying, among other things, talking about the applicant's responsibility to provide all required information. Wait a minute, where are you again? I'm sorry. Chapter, Chapter 2, two subdivision. subdivision. First page, B. Sorry, I'm, you're working from the combined document and I'm working I'm trying to from make all notes six too. Pull out okay. separately, yeah. Basically, in the middle of the page, we're saying it's the intent that it's the applicant's sole responsibility to provide all required information, etc. Failure to provide said information may cause the application to be rejected and returned to the applicant. My concern there is, so if somebody misses something because he didn't understand it, 
we could conceivably just throw it back and say, go get, bring it back when it's right, rather than helping him identify any of the missing information so that he can prove out that application instead of starting over again. It just well, seems a little abrupt. Well, it's an, it's an abrupt sentence that I copied out of another part of the code, and, in, and I agree with you, it's abrupt, and in all reality, that's not how we treat people. It says may. So, so I could certainly look at modifying that language and... and um, yeah, I mean, it's one thing or if someone take it out, says, you know, I don't, I don't bring that to you. But if, if he didn't interpret something, especially since he's now having to look at the zoning ordinance, the operating standards, and the city charter, it would be helpful to indicate that it would have to be an egregious omission or, or refusal to provide rather than oversight. Well, it says it may, not that it will cause application. Well, may means anybody can do it if they choose to. You know, I can look at that and either delete it or think of some softer language to put in there to, to just kind of explain that better in, in the way that we really do do that. That's, I That's all. Problem with that. Again, I'm used to dealing with contracts. Contracts are there to anticipate what, what, what's the worst case that might happen and how do you either prevent it or deal with it. And that's maybe, what I'm trying to do here. Maybe you could introduce the word rectify or... And, and that's really, I think, what staff does. They, they could sit down with yeah. and go through the list. Well, you've missed this or this isn't exactly what we need there. He has a chance to go back and prove it out. And, and just maybe just, just explain that instead of being rejected, it may cause a delay in the process. There you go. You know, yeah, because that's what happens. Because this implies it's going to have to start over again. Because basically that's what happens now. I mean, somebody submits something and they're missing these two things, and I don't necessarily come back and reject it, but I will let them know that, you know, if we don't get this in by a certain time, this will delay getting you scheduled for planning commission. I mean, that's usually, you know. I'm just trying to protect everybody from the grumpy Gus who comes along after we're all dead and buried. <laughs> or, or maybe we inherit somebody from Adams County who's no longer working for the county. Can't just I didn't say that. The new, uh, reject stamp, she'll have to get rid of it. <laughs> Believe it or not, you're done. I'm done. Okay. <coughs> Anybody else have any specific requests? Okay. Well, I think we're we're done with that item. Um, does anybody else have anything for the agenda? I did we want to do a quick uh, update on tomorrow night's meeting uh, meetings, <laughs> plural. Yeah. Well, I've had a lot of questions about this. We do have an Inspire Littleton forum as previously scheduled, um, and as you know, council has in their. Uh, Request to become educated about economic development. They sent out a request to the mayor of uh, Denver, who accepted, but is on a very tight schedule. So it really wasn't meant to screw up our schedule. It just happened to occur tomorrow night as well at six o'clock at the same time. Um, we are, uh, and, and to be absolutely honest and in full disclosure, I'm going to go see the mayor of Denver. So I will be at that because, um, as we mentioned. Economic development is becoming part of community development, so um, Dennis will be leading the discussion for Inspire Littleton tomorrow night, and uh, we are planning on going forward. And that starts at what time? That starts at 6.30. And which is, uh, the memo that went out said 6. I think that's what you were looking at. It says 6.30 there, right? Well. Yes. It's supposed to be 6.30 because it's after... Oh, you know oh, what? I think on? they ended early, so council can get to... Hmm. Ah, okay, so we are going to have our... I'm trying to remember where I saw that notice. It was something that came to us. Oh, it was in Dennis's, Dennis's update. Dennis's memo, right? Right. Yeah, it said starting at 6.30. And I suspect that's what the website says, too. Well, it will start at 6.30. Um, but the other, I believe the economic forum starts at 6 o'clock. So actually, council's going to bug out of the, um, uh, the their forum. It'll for, still start at four thirty. Yes. It'll just end earlier. Well, no, it'll go on. It's just it'll be without it'll the council. Council will leave when the ice cream and the pizza run out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I would, I would like to suggest that at our next meeting we kind of share information from the two meetings because I think I'm also going to go to the mayor forum and I know some of you will be at the Come on, we had a chance to get our attendance up. Because <laughs> uh, yeah. the, the topic is actually very interesting tomorrow night uh, for, for the, uh, the neighborhood meeting. I'd love to be there, but I, I think it would be good to, for us to hear both, so maybe we can share that information at the next meeting, just a brief so, report. So what time do we need to be there tomorrow? Okay. At our meeting, it will be 6.30. 6 o'clock at the, um, it's at the uh, museum for the uh, mayor, Denver. Okay. And you, you all saw Dennis's um, update on the survey, it sounds like. There's some increasing uh, attendance on that. Mm. Yeah. And then um, we were talking briefly about the sort of ongoing, um, the ongoing public input sessions, what might happen. I, I, I think I missed the meeting when you talked about that planning sort of retreat or a two-day work session with with uh, speakers and so on so I, I think we want to think about how that happens when that happens uh, right now probably be in September I think. yeah and, and what we've been doing is thinking about those last two meetings August 28th and September 25th and um, and some of the things I've heard is uh, if we could do something a little bit more interactive, and that's where I did a brief presentation I called the Planet Palooza. Um, and it's just a way of kind of uh, doing some kind of land use planning activity with, with folks to kind of get them engaged. And it would be also kind of a compilation of everything we've discussed up to that point. So we, we could present some of the trends we've seen um, are thinking speakers, perhaps it's a, a planning director from another community, um, uh, a developer that's in Denver and also in the local area, talk about constraints and issues that he looks at. And then also I thought, well, uh, and there's been some concern in the Planning Commission of what we hear on Littleton, it's almost like we have an unending budget which of course we don't, and we have to make tough decisions, so perhaps we actually have the budget director kind of talk about the nuts and bolts of what it takes to run a city. And then we meld that into the process, but it's, it's, it's very early, and we want to think that through a little bit and present a little bit more detailed idea. I think it would be helpful when we're, when we're thinking this through that we make it clear what staff, planning commission, City Council and the citizens should expect from that. You know what what they're going to hear in terms of background information. What what might be done with whatever the outcomes are from that, so that mm -hmm. they don't go in with unrealistic expectations. That this is it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, and believe me, that's something rattling around my head too. Okay. Other item. Um, there's a memo here from Doreen on the APA conference. Um, right, yeah. If you're interested, we do have funds available. Um, I know Andrew asked that question. So um, I haven't been to the local conference. He probably has. I assume they're usually where I came from, the local ones were a little bit more specific to the issues you deal with. And Actually, this one looked, I mean, just perusing through it, it looked good to me. I, I mean, it's And they do have, I think, a half day dedicated to planning commission they do. issues. Usually they have a, I haven't looked at that thoroughly, but I know they usually have like, they have some that are specifically geared towards the planning commissioners. So. I assume that this is a typo, that the full conference is actually cheaper than the one day registration. Um, I didn't look at this. <laughs> oh, and, and there's an interesting session here yeah, dealing yeah, with Brad and Kurt and I probably have to go to in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, well, <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't look correct. Is, is the, uh, <laughs> Thanks to Jen for pointing that out. I'll give you credit. What is it? <laughs> give you credit for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> Mark? Sure, yeah, yeah. 
And, and actually, I'll, I'll be speaking. I'll, I'm one of, uh, I'll be speaking in the session, one of the sessions. Good for so. you. Awesome. So you need some peanut galleries to yes, on back Friday. you up or rad you, right? Friday afternoon, <laughs> so. Are we allowed to bring signs and be <laughs> 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 Ask you difficult questions. Fred said he was going to bring tomatoes, but he just uh -oh. offered it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's in Snowmass, so it should be a beautiful area to go. Mm -hmm. 320 on the fifth. I don't see you, Jenny. Okay. And so if there's no other business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn early. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, well, thank you.